Good morning, class. Good morning, teacher. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Who told somebody about Jesus this week? Okay. All right. Who tried? Okay. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Glad you tried. Um, in our reading the Bible through this past week, who's on time reading your Bible through? Good, good, good. All right. Uh, and who's hanging their heads? Uh, oh, okay. All right. Uh, well, that was a quick trip. <laughs> All right. Um, and let's see what else. I guess uh, that's it. We're going to skip the trivia today since I messed up on the, the email. So... Uh, we're going to move right into the lesson today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 19. So a little, a little background uh, on the lesson. Uh, today's lesson, the, the overall theme is about encouragement. And uh, over the coming days, we're going to have opportunities to encourage uh, people that are hurting, people that are struggling, uh, people that have uh, sickness or grief or uh, any other challenges, uh, and and frankly, that's what the church is called to do, and and that's a part of discipleship is encouraging one another. In Matthew 28, we're told to go and make disciples of all nations. So, um, well, let me ask a question. How do you make a disciple? Hmm? Come alongside them. Spend time with them. Be a mentor. Be a mentor to them. To be one to uh, uh, begin with, uh, in Celebrate Recovery, we, we call that relationship the sponsor-sponsee relationship, uh, where we spend time with one another deliberately and on purpose. Uh, frankly, with the pandemic uh, having shut down churches and, and social gatherings and so forth, if you thought discipleship was simply discipleship training programs, then discipleship would have been shut down. But since it is one-on-one -on -one relationships, uh, then it, discipleship has continued to take place during uh, this difficult time that we've been through. Uh, I want to read... This is in your in your study guide, in the student guide, in uh, on page twenty. In two thousand seven, California pastor Dan Kimball published a book titled "They Like Jesus but Not the Church: Insights from Emerging Generations." The book is a compare uh, is a compilation of coffee shop interviews with older teens and twenty somethings. The gist of the book is that many young people like Jesus, they like Jesus, but they have strongly critical views of his church. The church to them is political, judgmental, oppressive, homophobic, arrogant, and full of fundamentalists. The irony is that these same young people long for authentic relationships, a place where they can be vulnerable and ask their questions, a place to belong, that is, to experience true community. Why is that ironic? Because that is what the church of Jesus Christ is meant to be a community of baptized believers who share a common life together, encouraging one another and helping each other 
look more and more like Jesus. All right, my question to you this morning is, who are you helping to look more and more like Jesus? Well, we can't blame people for not liking the church at times because at times we fail people. At times we have been judgmental. At times we have been unkind. Whether it, it's someone sits in our normal seat or someone shows up dressed in a way that we think is inappropriate. Uh, whether someone comes in wearing a hat, a guy wearing a hat, uh, you know, we can we can say some things that are unkind. And sometimes people have been unkind to us, and it makes us unkind to somebody else. And sometimes one of our brothers and sisters have been unkind to us. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so let's talk about how do we act like the church ought to act like? And how do we be about the business of uh, encouraging one another? In the email, I took a line from uh, uh, a song, Oh, Give Me a Home Where the Buffalo Roam, <laughs> where never is heard, this ought to be about the church, where never is heard a discouraging word, okay? Uh, man, wouldn't that be nice? Mm -hmm. To come to church, enjoy our fellowship with one another, expecting to be encouraged where never is heard a discouraging word. Wouldn't that be delightful? Yeah. Uh, but that's what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place where we encourage one another, where we help one another in their walk become a little more like Jesus today than they were yesterday. So we're going to begin in verse 19 of Acts chapter 11. So let's, uh, let's begin with that. It says, now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, or the Greeks, or the heathen, uh, the non-Jews, also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord and stead, with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. This event... Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution. If you ever hear a gospel minister say that God only wants what's good for you, run. If, if you hear someone say that if you act right and do right, you'll prosper because that's what God wants for you. 
tell that to Stephen. Tell that to each of the apostles who died uh, terrible deaths for their faith. I want to submit to you that God the Father uses the persecution of the church as a method of spreading the gospel. Now, on a local scene, we might kind of pervert that a little bit and say, well, in the Baptist church, God uses church splits to plant new churches. (laughs) (laughs) But seriously, uh, God has down through the ages used persecution to spread the gospel. The communists in China persecute the church relentlessly. But there are some provinces in China that, uh, at least one or two, that it is reported that 90% of the residents of that province are Christians. I heard a story uh, just this morning about one of those provinces that uh, they are required, all the provinces are required to bring a certain percentage of their rice crop to the government each year or at harvest time. And some of the provinces will mix some gravel in with it to make the weight the required weight of the rice in trying to uh, do some funny business with with the, the weight so that they can get by. But this particular province that's known for its Christian majority has a reputation that when they bring their rice, it's always pure. So when the other trucks are lined up there, to be sorted through and reviewed and uh, inspected to make sure that the gravel, you know, that they account for that and discount the, the weight because of that. The trucks from this particular province, the Christian province, go to the head of the line and dump their loads without inspection because the authorities know they're going to do it right. They have a reputation. But the Christianity, uh, the church in China has flourished under extraordinary, extraordinary persecution. Most of the church leaders in China have spent time in jail at one time or another because it's illegal to hold church services there. They bulldozed churches uh, recently uh, trying to strike terror into the heart of believers. Uh, But one of the church fathers, Tertullian, said about that persecution that was going on then of the church by the Roman government, he said, the more you mow us down, the thicker we rise. The thicker we rise. The Christian blood you spill is like the seed you sow. It springs from the earth again and is more fruitful and more fruitful. Well, one of the reasons that church in industrialized countries, modernized countries is apparently in decline uh, is when the church is soft when the church is fat, dumb, and happy, it doesn't grow like it does when it's under persecution. Well, uh, here we're, we're learning about the spread of the gospel in the first century. 
And the persecution began that day when Stephen was martyred. You'll remember that. They laid their clothes or their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, Tarsus is just across a bay from Antioch, so we're going to get into that here in a minute. Uh, now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, that was on the coast northwest of Jerusalem, and Cyprus, which was a Greek island, and Antioch. Antioch is in what's today known as Turkey, and it's 290 miles north of Jerusalem. If we were to try to put it in perspective, 290 miles is about the distance from here to uh, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, or uh, uh, about uh, in, in that area. Uh, Antioch was a really important city at that time. As a matter of fact, it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire behind Rome and Alexandria. Antioch was a major metropolis there and a center of uh, commerce. And it was uh, on, on a river there, the Orontes River. And in an important city. Uh, so these guys left Jerusalem because of the persecution. You know, the, the time that they were spending in Jerusalem, think about this. If you were in the middle of an enormous explosion of the gospel, thousands of people at the time coming to Jesus, why would you leave? <laughs> why would you leave that and I'm sure that's the way these people felt they had come to Jerusalem for the festival the day of Pentecost had arrived the Holy Spirit was, was given and was now inside people and revival broke out the church is exploding and it is one of the places that is nearest heaven on earth at the moment Christians there were in one accord. They were loving on each other. They, uh, Barnabas began this movement. He had some property and he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet for the needs of the poor in the church. There's some beautiful acts of generosity and worship taking place in Jerusalem. And to think about being in a church. So many people coming to know Jesus. And you're in one accord. What an encouragement. There's unity there. And there's beauty in that. And there's fire in the belly of every believer. To want to go tell somebody else about Jesus. And people are coming to know Jesus. Wow, why would you ever want to leave that? Well, that was the situation in Jerusalem until Stephen was martyred. Think about that for a minute. We think about the death of Stephen as a tragedy. But the persecution that followed was the explosion of the gospel out from Jerusalem. It drove the people out and they came wherever they came to. They brought the gospel message with them and they told people about Jesus. Well, I'm afraid some of us may be content with where we are rather than being willing to go wherever God leads us. And there was a scattering that took place. And these folks went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And what were they doing, according to this verse? 
They were speaking the word. Now, it was limited. They were speaking the word to no one except the Jews because, well, we don't know why, other than the church was mainly made up of Jews out of Jerusalem. And that was, maybe they didn't have a notion that the, the, the Greeks or the, the heathen, the non-Jews could actually be saved. We don't know uh, about that. But anyway, that would, they had limited the scope of their messages to the Jew only. Verse 20 gives us, but there were some, there were some that began to preach the gospel to the heathen. Aren't you glad that us non-Jews... <laughs> Were, were privileged to hear the gospel and it wasn't just limited to the Jew. Uh, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus, uh, island off of Greece, and Cyrene, which is west of Egypt in what is modern day Libya or thereabouts, uh, who on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, the Greek, the, the heathen, the non-Jew, also talked to them too, preaching the Lord Jesus. Preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, were these, were these men, were all these people that, that left Jerusalem and were sharing the gospel, were they ordained preachers? No. No. They were just regular guys and ladies regular Christians preaching the Lord Jesus, telling people about God's plan as outlined in the scripture to bring a Messiah and he's come and his name is Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. How many of you would like to say this morning, and some can say with confidence, the hand of the Lord is with me. The hand of the Lord is on what I'm about today. Well, the hand of the Lord was with them as they were preaching the Lord Jesus. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Great number. So the church in Antioch is growing because these refugees from Jerusalem have taken the gospel with them. You think these folks would qualify as refugees fleeing a religious persecution? What else would you call them? They probably did have great pushback from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yeah. Messiah was going to be a warrior. Yeah. Not a humble man. There was a misconception about what Messiah was going to look like and do when he arrived, for sure. But here, the Lord was with them. So there's a great revival that has broken out in Antioch. And, and as, as will happen, news got back to Jerusalem. News got back to Jerusalem that, oh my word, the Gentiles are being brought into the church. The Gentiles are being brought into the church. Can you believe it? The Gentiles are being brought into the church. I'm sure that was the subject of the discussion back in Jerusalem. And there were some in Jerusalem that felt... Oh, well, we've got to go up there and teach them that if you come to Jesus, you've got to be circumcised and follow the law. Can you imagine the altar call? The altar call. Come to Jesus, repent of your sins, and then go see the man over here with the knife, guys. I'm sure some of the women were saying, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Same law, but we couldn't. 
Hmm. So, uh, but instead of sending one of the Judaizers, one of the one of the legalists, one of the people that believe that you had to, if you're going to be a Christian, you had to be a good Jew and follow the Jewish laws, all 613 of them. Instead of sending somebody like that, they sent Barnabas. Barnabas, we meet him back in the fourth chapter. Uh, and by the way, Barnabas is from Cyprus. Okay? So you just we, we just read that some of the guys that were preaching the gospel there in Antioch were from Cyprus. He may have known some of them. But anyway, they sent Barnabas, son of encouragement, son of consolation, uh, what his name means. And we meet him back in the fourth chapter in Acts where he sold that property and laid it at the apostles' feet. We also see him in chapter 9 where Saul of Tarsus has, has, has met Jesus on the road to Damascus and he goes back from Damascus into Jerusalem and the apostles are saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We know who this guy is. We know his reputation. But it was Barnabas who took him and presented him and said, he's not the same man that he was. Barnabas encouraging, supporting, helping. Barnabas is the church. Barnabas is the picture of the church uh, that, that we would do well to emulate when some scoundrel comes to know Jesus. There may be somebody in the church that's, that would whisper to their neighbor, yeah, but it won't last. <laughs> you know, you may have heard some of that in the past. Instead, Barnabas was the one that would come alongside and encourage that person rather than standing askance and saying, yeah, but it won't last. So, so they, uh, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came, he saw the problems there. When he came, he saw all the things that were wrong. Is that what it says? What does it say? Verse 22. <laughs> when he came to Antioch, he saw not the problems. He saw not the missteps that early Christians make. When he came to Antioch, he saw not the uh, wild enthusiasm of fresh Christians and looked down on it. What he saw, according to this verse, was the grace of God. He saw the grace of God and he was glad. He was thrilled. Can you imagine? Young Christians are going to make mistakes. Brand new Christians are going to do some things in their enthusiasm that might otherwise seem to be outrageous. Young Christians are going to make mistakes. But that's not what Barnabas saw. What Barnabas saw was that people were coming to Jesus and they're coming to Jesus and now many of them needed somebody to disciple them, to encourage them, to stand with them and help them in their new faith. So he saw what he saw the grace of God and he was thrilled and he encouraged them. He exhorted them. He talked with them. He preached to them. He exhorted them all to remain 
faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Now, what purpose was that? What did he say that your new purpose is as new believers? Remain faithful. And what? And tell others. Our purpose is to remain faithful ourselves, tell others about Jesus, and then disciple people. Help them along the way. Um, to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Verse 24 for he, and the reason why he was doing this, the Bible says he was a good man. A good man. By the way, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit through Luke does not say that about another human being. Barnabas is the only one. The Holy Spirit doesn't say this about Paul in the book of Acts. But it does say it about Barnabas. <clears throat> he was the encourager. Barnabas was the encourager. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Now let's look at our second passage of Scripture. We're going to begin with verse 25. Um uh, so it's, it's just two verses, 25 and 26. Um, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. It's been nine years since Barnabas saw Saul of Tarsus. Nine years since he presented him to the uh, church there in Jerusalem and made it possible for Saul to be accepted among the brethren there. So it's been nine years. Barnabas is in Antioch. Great revival going on, but he sees a need. He sees a need that these folks need to be instructed and trained and discipled. So he goes to Tarsus. Now he's going... Across the, uh, 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 the sea there to the west, a couple of hundred miles, over to Tarsus. And uh, that's in, in, in modern day Turkey. And so he went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he, how do you think he found him? Think about that for a minute. What do you think Saul would have been doing while he was there in Tarsus? Preaching. He, preaching, telling people about Jesus. So you go to town and you say, uh, where, where can I find a man who is preaching Jesus? <laughs> and I imagine that's... Uh, uh, that's one of the ways he did that was, and he searched for him and he found him. Uh, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. By the way, I wonder if Saul, who became Paul, would have ever left home, which is where he was, in Tarsus, that's where he grew up, Saul of Tarsus, all right? He was at home. I wonder if Saul, who became Paul, would have ever gone on those missionary journeys if Barnabas hadn't gone to Tarsus and got him and brought him to Antioch. You know, you've got to wonder about those things. You never know the impact of you encouraging just one person how that might affect thousands of people through that person. You never know. But Barnabas went and got this one man. 
brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, it says, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. This is the establishment of the first Greek or Gentile church. The church at Antioch. Man, think about their first two preachers. Wow! Their, 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 their uh, pastoral team. Barnabas and Saul of Tarsus. Well, I just couldn't get any better than that, right? Well, they spent a year discipling the leadership of the church there. All of the believers. Anybody that wanted to be led into a closer walk with Jesus was able to do that under the teaching and preaching of Saul and Barnabas. Now, we're told, go and make disciples. I want to encourage you today. If you're not pouring your life into at least one other person, We are, if, if you're not doing that, I want to encourage you to, to begin. If you'll pray, God, lead me to the right person or lead that person to me, he'll answer that prayer. Amen. He will answer that prayer. Um, so we need to be about the business of pouring our life out for, for others. So they spent a year, a whole year it says, and met with the church and taught a great many people. It doesn't say they taught them all. It does not say they taught them all. It says they taught a great many people. Do you know there are some folks in the church today even. That say I don't need that. I don't need that. I'm okay the way I am. Alright. In Dante's Inferno. One of the categories of pride that he lists is the pride of knowledge. I know all I need to know. I don't need to know anymore. I'm okay the way I am. That's pride. So they taught a great many people there. I want to encourage you to continue to learn. When you have opportunity, continue to learn. And be a part of, of training. And, and that's why we're here today, right? That's why we're here today is to learn more about how to be like Jesus. And to have compassion. To learn how to have compassion on people that are hurting. And then to take action. Yes, sir. Like you said, <clears throat> somewhere we need to be fast. Faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and and teachable. Okay? Faithful, available, teachable. Wow, you know, as I look around, this is the largest Sunday school class that we've had in almost a year, maybe a year. Uh, your faithfulness, thank you for coming. I appreciate that. It encourages me. Thank you. Uh, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. That wasn't necessarily a nice thing then. Uh, they were identified. <clears throat> certainly it was nice to be identified with Christ. Uh, but the, uh, in the past they had been called followers of the way. Here in Antioch, they were the first church, the first non-Jew, Jewish, Christian church is planted, the first Gentile church. They are called Christians. We begin to see the life of Christ coming alive in people there in Antioch. Um, we have a, a, a fill-in on your page 22 in your uh, student guide. It's about discipleship. Discipleship is a process that takes place both formally and informally to affect spiritual maturity as people follow Jesus. 
We make disciples through our words and actions, providing verbal instruction from God's word and nonverbal examples through our lives. Uh, so the four fill-ins are process, maturity, word, and examples. Now let's move on to the last section, verses 27 through 30. Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius, so the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Agabus uh, was uh, one of the prophets that came up from Jerusalem, a uh, man filled by the Spirit of God who said, "There's suffering is coming. Suffering is coming. And can I say to the church, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but suffering is coming. Uh, the enemy wishes to destroy the church. Suffering is coming. You're going to experience personal suffering from time to time. Jesus told us that if you follow him, suffering is going to happen. It's going to happen. And as we see other people suffering, I don't need to cite examples. We have plenty right here in our own church. As you see people suffering, be about the business of of encouraging, helping to relieve the suffering if you can, but encourage one another. This prophet said there's coming a famine. By the way, this is the same prophet that told Paul later in his ministry, don't go up to, if you go up to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound and you're going to be handed over to the authorities. Same, same prophet. Um, uh, but there was a great famine. And the records show that there were several during this time that came. Uh, and so they determined that they wanted to send relief to the brothers down in, 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 in and around Jerusalem, in Judea. And they did so, sending to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. They took a great offering from the church in Antioch, from the Gentile church in Antioch to the Jewish church in Jerusalem. And think about this. The Jew had traditionally looked at the Gentile as less than human. There was an opportunity for the Gentiles to be resentful at the way they had been treated for hundreds of years by the Jew. But when it came to be in the church, they said, we're going to look past that. We're going to express love to our brothers. The church is made up now of Gentiles and Jews, all people, all people, same today. We're going to look past their past imperfections, their past prejudice, their, their past uh, uh, meanness against us. We're going to look past that. And we're going to send a love offering down there to them. What a beautiful picture of the church at work. Let's encourage one another. And I encourage you today to look around. Keep your eyes open. See who is suffering and see what you can do about it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together so uh, so much here to learn and so much of it is humbling as we as we consider the folks around us that are hurting help us Lord to be that one that encourages our Christian brother and sister and uh, encourages each of us to be a little closer to Jesus today than we were yesterday. Help us do that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.